Hey everyone, so I'm going to do a very quick review of this paper that we read recently that delves into the uh, the nature of um, proximal to distal movement sequencing that has really been seen as the movement strategy expressed during lots of movement tasks in the real world. But within this paper, they describe other movement strategies that can be used for different tasks. Now, the paper is called Task and Skill Level Constraints on the Generality of the Proximal to Distal Principle for Within Limb Movement Coordination. And it's, it's really a paper, a paper that is very important to the, the approach that, that we take at IKM. Because when we're, um, when we're assessing and, and rehabbing or loading the movement system of an individual, we, we do need to appreciate that, um, it's, it's not just about the, the individual's movement strategies, but it's about the, um, the appropriateness of those movement strategies within the context of the task. Okay. So, this study nicely describes the uh, the differences between tasks that require more of a, a force absorption bias, where we have to manage load or deal with forces acting on error anatomy, okay, versus more propulsive bias tasks where we're acting on the environment or acting on something else where we're producing forces with the intention of overcoming external forces, okay? So the study mainly focuses on how our movement strategies are influenced by task constraints. Okay. But of course we do, we also need to consider and appreciate that, um, someone's movement, uh, it will be different within the context of the task constraints, but it will also be very different within the context of the environmental constraints as well. So is the environment more predictable or is it more unpredictable? It, are we moving in more of a, a closed chain environment or an open chain environment? <clears throat> Because this will have a big influence on the movement strategies that we express as well. Okay, so I wanted to focus on two um, two key task categories here, and that's open versus closed chain movements and absorption versus propulsive bias movements of tasks. Okay, so what you'll find when when researching uh, proximal to distal movement sequencing is that a lot of the movement tasks that are used in um, in many of the studies are very much open chain in nature and propulsive biased in nature okay so using movements like throwing or movements like kicking okay and, and during these tasks we're very much acting on the environment where we're trying to overcome external forces okay and when you link that that concept back to the unique uh, architectural design of our anatomy it makes sense as to why these tasks will bias more approximate to distal sequence where proximal segments will move first and facilitate the movement of the more distal segments. So during a task like throwing, the trunk may initiate the movement, and that's going to facilitate the movements of the distal segments into the upper arm, into the forearm, and then into the hand and the wrist. And the reason behind this is because a lot of our muscle mass across our anatomy is distributed proximally versus distally. Okay, So generating movement through these proximal segments first can facilitate the velocity of the smaller and lighter distal segments. But again, it's not all about acting on the environment okay because if we look at this distinction between uh, closed chain tasks okay the end of the the end point of the limb the hand of the foot is not free to move during those kind of tasks and so the the coordination within the limb takes on a, a different role or a different behavior because now the distal segments need to manage forces acting on the anatomy first before we begin to act on the environment or express more propulsive behaviors in a proximal to distal manner. Okay. So this, there's this shift from proximal to distal to more of a distal to proximal strategy or sequence in that scenario. Okay. And, and it really also highlights the, um, the, the nature of more absorption by strategies as well, where the goal is to manage forces acting on us instead of us always acting on the environment, okay? So this is all well and good, but what are the re rehabilitation implications? Where does it fit into our practice as health and fitness practitioners, working with people experiencing pain um, or with movement limitations and performance limitations? So what we need to do is, is recognize the movement strategies that our clients are working towards trying to get better at, or maybe what what movements they're experiencing difficulty with. And then we can step back and appreciate what kind of movement strategies they're already using. And if there's a mismatch between the strategy and what's needed for the actual task, and then we can work towards restoring those capacities. So for example, what you'll often see in, in many papers that look at neuromechanical control across the anatomy is an inappropriate shift from distal 
to proximal strategies to more proximal to distal bias strategies. So when they should be distal and proximal, they become proximal to distal. So many clients with, with chronic ankle instability, for example, the distal segments are unable to express that role to manage forces acting on the system, acting on the foot. Okay, so they, they struggle to distribute that load from distal to proximal in a distal to proximal sequence. And so what happens then is they just express more workload proximally. There's that shift in the sequencing, there's that shift in the strategy. So you might see that represented as um, increased muscle tension, increased muscle tone expressed proximally around the hip or the low back, for example. Okay. So <clears throat> what we have here is an individual using more of a, a proximal dominant strategy for which should be a distal dominant strategy where the forces are dampened distally but filtered proximally. And it's our job as practitioners then to assess the, the, the necessary capacities for the movement strategies that need to be expressed and then work towards restoring those capacities if they're missing in the clients within a step-by-step -step framework, okay? So really the key thing here is, is appreciating um, the movement strategy that the individual we're working with is, is currently using, not in isolation, but within the context of the task constraints and then further into the environmental constraints, okay? And this is really something that we cover in a lot of detail on our IKEA approach courses and delve into lots of practical assessments and rehab and loading strategies. So if this sounds like something that you'd be interested in or that you want to integrate into your current approach, be sure to check out our courses or reach out to us more for uh, more information. So thanks so much for listening.